the church in Ethiopia, it spreads like wildfire so that by the 4th and 5th centuries, North Africa is the hub of Christianity at that time. That's where you have St. Augustine and other early church fathers. By that time, the church is just grown by leaps and bounds in that area. Philip is taken by the Spirit into Azotus. It's, I think it's a series of cities. He goes there, preaches there, has a ministry there, and then makes his way from Azotus to Caesarea. Caesarea is going to be his home base after that. And later, a little bit later, we'll see that he's in Caesarea. And that's when everything comes together towards the end. Meanwhile, <coughs> Saul of Tarsus, pleased with himself that he has personally stoned Stephen and is now persecuting with religious zeal and ferocity like no other Pharisee in Jerusalem. <coughs> he is imprisoning men. He's imprisoning women at night. He's going into homes. He's doing what nobody else is daring to do. Goes and asks for authority from the high priest to get letters that give him the authority to go to Damascus and to go into synagogues and to arrest Christians. He leaves with that authority and on the Damascus road, Saul of Tarsus has an encounter that will change his life and the world and our lives too. Because he's hit with light. Light like he's never seen before. Light that is so intense it blinds him. It, it says that he fell to the ground. I think fall is very gently, a very gentle way of saying he fell to the ground and he ate dirt when he hit the ground. And Jesus asks him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the first thing out of Saul's mouth when he hits the ground, Yes, Lord. Who are you, Lord? And when he says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting, I think he cowered back in fear. He was probably thinking, uh-oh. What have I done? What's going to happen now? Jesus tells him to get up and to go to Damascus, and he'll have other instructions for him. And when he gets up, he's blind. And the people who are with him have to help him. They guide him to Damascus. In Damascus, in a dream or vision, God appears to a man named Ananias and tells Ananias, I want you to go to a house where Saul of Tarsus is staying on the, road, on the street called Straight. And Ananias tells the Lord, he's like, you know this is Saul of Tarsus, right? This is the man who's persecuting your church. And God says, go. He has to suffer great things for me, and he will stand before kings, and he will he'll use him to basically convert the Gentiles. Ananias goes, meets Paul, meets Saul, talks with him, and then takes him and baptizes him. And Saul, a miraculous thing happens. Scales fall off of his eyes. And I believe that when those scales fell off of that young Pharisee's eyes, I believe that was a physical representation of what had happened in his heart. Because I believe the weight of being a Pharisee, of strict adherence to the Mishnah, to all of that, everything, the legalism that had bound this man fell away. He was now free, and God could use him. Within a few days of that, he is already proclaiming Jesus in synagogues, and people are astounded. This is the man who was in Jerusalem, who came to Damascus so he could arrest Christians, and here he is proclaiming Jesus as Lord and Messiah in a synagogue. <laughs> the Jews in Damascus, some of the Jews, plot to kill him. So they have, to, they have to smuggle him out. So they arrange, some of the Christians in Damascus arrange for Paul, no longer Saul, but Paul, to go to Tarsus, his hometown, and stay there. At some point in the future, Barnabas comes and gets him, brings him back to Jerusalem, 
He meets with the apostles. And then they go to Antioch. And at Antioch, they meet a man named Agabus. A man, a prophet named Agabus is preaching there. Agabus means locust or grasshopper. He's preaching about a famine. And the famine actually happened. There's proof of that. Um, in secular history, Josephus talked about the, the famine, Suetonius and Tacitus all mentioned it in their writings during the time of Emperor Claudius by this time. And Agabus, they, they encounter Agabus, then they go off on their missionary journeys, and thus begins the career, the amazing career of this man, Paul the Apostle who is the apostle of the Gentiles, who without him, we, don't, we would know next to nothing about our faith. We wouldn't know about justification. We wouldn't, I don't think we would fully understand how Jesus' death on that cross was our propitiation. We wouldn't understand about faith, that you, faith, faith is the only thing that saves you. You can't, works can't save you. Works are an outward display of your faith, but they cannot save you. So then, at some point after his, when he's in Ephesus, in the third, we're going to skip ahead, in his third missionary journey, he's in Ephesus, and he's in Ephesus for about two years. And shortly before he leaves, he feels very strongly that he needs to go to Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of debate among theologians about whether or not Paul should have gone to Jerusalem. There are some who think that he missed the mark, that he was disobedient to God. I deal with that, and when I, when I taught on this, I don't believe that. I believe he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. He was exactly where God wanted him to be. But when he was at Ephesus, before he left, he told, those, he told that church that he would never see them again that he was going to go, and he was going to suffer great things. And they wept, like they would if it was us, if we knew Paul. They didn't want him to go, but he had to. That's one thing about Paul. He was a very decided man. There was no shadow of turning in that man. Even back to his days as a Pharisee, he was very decided. And he carried that. I think God, that's one of those characteristics that God used in him even after his conversion. He was always a decided apostle. When he knew what God's plan was for his life and what he was supposed to do, nothing and no one was going to get in his way and was going to keep him from doing it. Oh, that I could be like that. I wish I had a tenth of that. He leaves Ephesus with Luke and the people who are with him. They make their way to Tyre, on their way back down into Israel. And Tyre, same thing. There are, there's a group of men in that, in, of Christians in that area that they stay with who feel in the spirit that he's going to suffer and that he's going to suffer in Jerusalem, and they warn him. And he tells them, I have to go. I have to go. This is what I'm called to do. They don't want him to, but he has to. Kind of like Jesus. When Jesus was teaching, was talking to the apostles and was telling them about how when he went to Jerusalem, he was going to suffer and he was going to die. And Peter even rebuked it and said, Lord, if you're going to go and this is going to happen to you, we can't have that. I'm not going to have that. And Jesus looked at him and said, get behind me, Satan. This is what I'm supposed to do. You're not going to keep me from doing this. Paul had to go to Jerusalem. They leave Tyre. They make their way from Tyre down to Caesarea. In Caesarea, they stay at the home of Philip the Evangelist. By now, a middle-aged man. By now, Paul's middle-aged. I, I, I have to imagine that at some point between his conversion and that moment, there had to have been a private meeting, possibly more, between Philip and Paul, where Paul, I think, asked Philip for his forgiveness. 
I think maybe he had to, he had to they had to come together and he had to make things right with him. Because I think Philip and Stephen and those deacons they were like brothers. They were one. They were like the apostles. They were one. They were brothers. And I think Philip, seeing how Philip was in his life, I think Philip forgave him. And now he's at Philip's home in fellowship. Philip was not only blessed with a ministry, he was not only blessed to be translated taken from one place by the Spirit and put down <coughs> somewhere else. He also was blessed with four daughters. All were Christian and all had the gift of prophecy. And I think that speaks so much about who this man was. That he wasn't just somebody who got up behind a pulpit or a platform in public and preached God and did miracles and healed people and cast out demons and then lived his life in private another way. I think who he was in public is who he was in private. And I think the fact that his daughters were all Christian, were virgins, not just unmarried, but I believe that means they were chaste too. Because for a long time, the definition of a virgin was a woman who was unmarried. But I think, I think both meanings apply to these women. I think they were unmarried and they were chaste and they were pure. And they were devoted to God. When they're at his home, Agabus shows up again. And Agabus comes in and takes Paul's sash or his belt and binds himself and says, the man who, had, who wore this belt or this sash will be bound like this in Jerusalem and will suffer. And everybody starts to cry and to beg Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Paul says, got to go. It's what I have to do. And Paul leaves, goes to Jerusalem. He's arrested. And that begins the second part of his ministry. I'm not going to get too much into that, but I do want to point out that when he was first converted, God told Ananias he would testify before kings and he would suffer greatly. He testified before kings because of his arrest. Because he went to Jerusalem and was arrested, he stood before Felix. He stood before Herod, the Herod, one of the Herods that was reigning at that time. And then he was sent to Rome. Because he was a Roman citizen. Because he was born in Tarsus. Tarsus was a special city. It was... Any male who was born in Tarsus was born the, uh, the son of a citizen of Tarsus was a Roman citizen. That's something that could only happen by imperial appointment. And it was done by Caesar Augustus. Because he was a Roman citizen, they couldn't beat him. They were going to flog him. And Paul opened his mouth and said, Is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen? And the centurion went and told the commander, and the commander came back and said, Are you a citizen of Rome? How is that? I bought it. Paul said, But I was born a citizen. And because of that, he was sent to Rome. And he testified among kings. He testified to Gentiles. I'm so glad. I'm so thankful for Paul. I'm so thankful that he went and did what he did. Because if he wouldn't have done that, I might not know Jesus. You might not know Jesus. The rest of the Western world wouldn't know Jesus because of that. Because of what he did. When I was teaching, God really used those teachings to speak into me. And I can honestly say that initially when I taught that, I was teaching, but God was teaching me. And I can honestly say I'm not the same because of what he taught me and what I learned when I was preparing for that. That's all I have. Thank you. Very well done, Andrea. Very well done. Under 30 minutes.
Oh, that's a record for me. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that sums up our review thus far of what we've done here over this last year in the property new and we'll have to see where where we go starting the, the new year next year is upon us and so we'll just have to see where the lord takes us and so let me uh get my prayer out May Yahweh, your Heavenly Father, kneel before you, making himself available to you, like a good father kneeling before his child in order to minister and bestow his gifts and promises. May Yahweh, your Heavenly Father, guard you with a hedge of thorn protection, that will prevent Satan and all your enemies from harming your body, soul, mind, and spirit, your loved ones, and all your possessions. May Yahweh, your Heavenly Father, illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you continually, bringing you to order so that you will fulfill your God-given destiny and purpose. May Yahweh, your Heavenly Father, provide you with perfect love and fellowship, never leaving you, and give you sustenance, provision, and friendship. May Yahweh, your Heavenly Father, lift up and carry his fullness of being towards you, bringing everything that he is to your aid, supporting you with his divine embrace and his entire being. May Yahweh, your Heavenly Father, set in place all you need to be whole and complete, so you can walk in victory moment by moment by the power of the Holy Spirit. May he give you supernatural health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfection, Fullness, rest, and harmony, as well as the absence of agitation and discord. Can we all say shalom? Shalom. 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 Thank you, Lord, for your shalom that you give us, Lord. Peace beyond all our understanding. We thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah.